Hi, uh, this is the review for test one. So, um, okay, so you have the review sheet for test number one. Uh, let's go through the problems. Uh, so in 3.7, uh, there's numbers two and eight. And I realize I need a textbook. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so, uh, so we need a textbook. There's the textbook problems. Uh, 3.7. Okay, so for 3.7, we have numbers 2 and 8 on the sheet. So let's go over number 2 first. And so number 2 says, uh, find the most general antiderivative of the function. Okay, so the function is f of x is equal to 8x to the 9th, bx to the 9th, minus 3x to the 6th, plus 12x cubed. Okay. And we want to find the most general antiderivative. So I want to pull that most general antiderivative capital F of x. I'm just going to take the antiderivative of each term and then add or subtract them. So an antiderivative of this would be 8 times x to the 10 over 10 minus 3 times x to the 7th over 7 plus 12 times x to the 4th over 4 plus c. And so to simplify that, uh, we get... Therefore, the capital F of x is equal to 8 tenths, which is 4 fifths x to the 10th, minus 3 sevenths x to the 7th, plus 12 over 4, which is plus 3 x to the 4th, plus capital C. And so that capital F is the most general antiderivative of the given little f of x. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. Yes, that's number two. Number eight. Uh, number eight is the same question. Find the most general antiderivative of the function. And so for number eight, our function is r of theta, uh, which is equal to secant theta tan theta um, minus two e to the theta. Okay, so we need to find the most general anti derivative of that function. So we call that most general antiderivative capital R of theta. And well that's going to be equal to tan theta uh, minus 2 e to the theta plus c. And so right an anti the most general antiderivative of secant theta tan theta is tan theta plus c because the derivative of tan theta is secant theta tan theta. Derivative of this is that antiderivative of this is that plus c. And then the an most general antiderivative of e to the theta is e to the theta plus c. So you just get tan theta minus two e to theta plus a, a c at the end, all right? And that's and that's a capital R of theta. And so that's numbers two and eight in section three point seven. All right. So that's how you. Those are examples of finding a general antiderivative of a function. I mean eraser also. Okay. So now. Uh, so that's 3.7. So next, um, let's go to 4.1. So 4.1, the problems are 7, 11, and 16. Okay. Uh, 4.1. Okay, so for number 7, in 4.1, it says evaluate the upper and lower sums for the function f of x equals 2 plus sine x. Upper and lower sums. From 0 less equal to x less than equal to pi. n equals 2, 4, and 8. Illustrate with diagrams. Okay. Let's do, let's not do every single one because then there would be three, there would be six, right? There would be six here. Let's choose n equals 4 
and let's choose lower sums. So just arbitrary, kind of in between one. So let's let's um, let's find the lower sum for f of x where n equals four. Okay. So the solution of that is let's graph first. Let's graph um, n from zero to pi. Let's graph two plus sine x. So two plus sine x. Um, if that's one, and that's two, and that's three. Normally sine ranges from negative one to one. But when you go plus two, it ranges from one to three. So normally it's from negative one to one. Then we're gonna shift it up two. And so it's gonna go from one to three. And so this is, instead of the x-axis, it's gonna be like, like y equals two. It's gonna be like the, pretty much drawing the sine graph, but where y equals two is now the, like the, where the x-axis will be done. Okay, so um, this is pi over 2, this is pi, this is 3 pi over 2, and this is 2 pi. And so now, I'm just going to graph it. We get that. So that's y equals 2 plus sine x. So that's y equals 2 plus sine x, and so if we choose n equals to 4, we want a lower sum. So for n equals 4, we're going to have pi over 2 as the length of the sub interval. And for a lower sum, we're going to take the smallest value on each sub interval. So the smallest value, wherever the smallest value is. So that's going to be here, here, and here. That's going to be a lower sum. Okay, so the area of these four rectangles, the sum of the areas of these four rectangles is going to be a lower sum with n equals to 4 of it. f of x equals 2 plus sine x. Okay, so f of x, so the area under the curve y equals 2 plus sine x, or 0 less or equal to x less or equal to pi, is approximately equal to um, pi over 2 times um, f of 0, because that's what the height is, plus pi over 2 times, this is f of pi, plus pi over 2 times f of 3 pi over 2 plus pi over 2 times 3 pi over 2. Okay? So, so this, both these intervals have this point as an endpoint, so it ends up being the lower lowest value from both sub intervals, okay? And so now this is equal to um, pi over 2 times, I'm just going to factor out these four. So f of 0 is 2 plus sine 0, which is 2, plus f of pi, which is 2 plus sine pi, which is 2, plus, and actually, this, um, if you plug in 3 pi over 2 here, and get 2 minus 1, which is 1, and you can see it's a 1 right there. Plus, uh, also, same, uh, oh, this is f of 3 pi over 2. Okay, and then, so that's also 1. All right, and so that's equal to pi over 2 times 2, 4, 5, 6, times 6. So pi over 2 times 6 is 3 pi. And so the area under the curve f of x equals 2 plus sine x from 0 to pi um, is estimated with lower sums, where n equals 4, by 3 pi. Alright? And so that's number 7. Okay, so let's go to the next one. That's a lower sum. You can see that the area it takes up less space than the area. It's less area than the actual area. Okay. 
for the min on each semitruple. The min value back on each semitruple. Okay, so now 11. Um, so for number 11 and 4.1, right, so you should read it in the book. Oil leaked from a tank at a rate of R of T liters per hour. The rate decreases as time passed, and values of the rate at two, two hour time intervals are shown in the table. Uh, find lower and upper estimates for the total amount of oil that leaked out. Okay, so let's, I'm going to copy down the table to help me present it here. So T of H is the first row, and R of T, which is in liters per hour, is in the second row. And so we have a bunch of, we have 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And we have 8.7, uh, 7.6, 6.8, 6.2, 5.7, and 5.3. Okay, 8.7, 7.6, 6.8, 6.2, 5.7, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 
You get exactly 70. There we go. Okay. So 70 liters, because this is in liters, so 70 liters is an upper estimate for the total amount of oil that leaks out during that 10 hour time period. Okay, so this is an example of an upper estimate. The previous example shall be an example of a lower estimate. All right, next one. So the next one is number 16. So for number 16, um, so for number 16, it says use definition two to find an expression for the area under the graph of F as a limit. Do not evaluate the limit. So for 16, we have F of X equals X squared plus the square root of one plus two X. And we have it on the interval four less equal to X less equal to seven. Okay, so we want to find the area under that curve f of x on that um, interval of x. Okay, so uh, so capital A, which is the area, um, is equal to um, as a limit. It's equal to the limit um, as the max. Um, that's one, two, two. I just want to make sure I'm using the same. Doing what they want to in the problem. So you should look at definition two to make sure, for this problem to make sure that that you're expressing the answer the way they want you to express the answer. More than one way to do it. Okay. So definition two, right? In the book, if you go back, it says the area A of the region S that lies under the graph of continuous function F is the limit of the sum of areas of approximate rectangles, right? And in the book, it tells you it's not, it's not that way. It's A equals the limit as N approaches infinity of R sub N, uh, which is equal to the limit of as N approaches A of X, F of X1 delta X plus F of X2 delta X plus F of X plus F of XN delta X. Sometimes getting the answer to a problem, it just means looking at the right page in the book, right? But okay, but so you should know. There's more than one way to express the answer, so it's not a bad thing. Okay, so now A equals the limit as N approaches infinity of, of now this sum. Well, so this would be um, plugging in X1, it would be F of X1 uh, delta X plus F of X2 delta X plus dot 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 plus F of X of N delta X. In summation notation, which is really how you should normally write this, this is the sum. It's a limit as n approaches infinity, but now this sum is, is the sum using the summation notation from i equals 1 to n of f of x of i delta x. And so now I'm expressing that as one sum. This is definition 2. This is definition 2. That equals sum. Okay? So I'm expressing this sum using summation notation. Okay, and so now this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of, now f of x of i, you just plug in x i there, so you get x i squared plus the square root of 1 plus 2 x of i. That's it. That's the sum. And so now we're expressing it as a limit, the area as a limit, using definition two. And so the A, capital A, is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of x of i squared plus two plus the square root of one plus two x of i. That's the answer. And so that's number 16. Okay, and where x, okay, good, and here x sub i 
the, the reason why 4 to x matters, right, why, where does that come in? Because here x of i is equal to 4 plus i delta x, where, where delta x is equal to 7 minus 4 over n. Oops, 7 minus 4 over n, which is 3 over n. Okay, so that's where uh, x of 4 to 7 comes in by how x of i is defined. Okay, so that's part of that, saying what x of i is and delta x is. Okay, so that's number 16 in 4.1. Continue. Next is 4.2, and 4.2 is numbers 2, 14, 20, and 35. Okay, 2, 14, 20, and 35. So 4.2, number 2. Okay, so 4.2, number 2. Um, evaluate the... Oh, sorry. If f of x equals x squared minus 2x, f of x equals x squared minus 2x, 0 less or equal to x less or equal to 3, evaluate the Riemann sum with n equals 6. Okay, so here n is equal to 6 in the Riemann sum, and the sample points are right endpoints, using right endpoints. Okay, so I'm just writing down some notes here. What does the Riemann sum represent? Illustrate with the diagram. Okay. Okay, so we're going to do this using right endpoints. So uh, let's graph x squared minus 2x. Um, so, so, so if you had x minus 1, I'm just going to quickly do this without a calculator. You can use a calculator for this. x minus 1 squared is x squared minus 2x plus 1. And so x minus 1 squared minus 1 is equal to x squared minus x. That's the function I want you to graph. So f of x, x which equals x squared minus 1, is equal to x squared minus 1 squared. I mean x minus 1 squared minus 1. And so what that is, is if you were to take the graph of y equals x squared, you would just move it to the right one and down one. And that's how you graph f of x here. So you do not need a calculator to graph this, okay? And so you move it to the right one and down one. So instead of the origin, you move to the right one and down one. And so now you're going to move to the point one comma negative one. When x is one, you get that zero squared minus one, okay? It's concave up, it's, it's, kind of, it's facing upward, the graph. Uh, when x is zero, okay, that, that, when x is zero, when x is two, you get two minus one squared which is 1 minus 1, which is 0. Okay, so then these are three points on the parabola. This is the bottommost point. I'm just going to connect them here. Okay, so that's the graph of f of x equals x squared, x minus 1 squared minus 1. Okay, so this is um, y equals x squared minus, minus 2x. x squared minus 2x is x minus 1 squared minus 1. So I just find that, and then and I'm just going to x minus 1 squared, minus 1, which is equal to that. Okay, uh, but okay, it's from 0 to 3. So, um, I don't want to let's scale. Let me try, let me try to draw this scale. To do that, I'm just going to have to, well, what I mean is, the, I don't need any more space here, so I'm going to have to shrink the y-axis. Okay, so I'm going to shrink the y-axis to be the same graph, I just need more room. Okay, so now, that's when, that's the x-axis and y-axis, that's when x equals 1. This is 1 comma negative 1, that's the origin. This is when x is 2. One, two, 
and this is 3. When x is 3, you get 9 minus 6, which is 3. Okay, so that's 1, 2, 3. And now you get this here. Okay, so that's the graph of y equals x squared minus 2x, which equals to x minus 1 squared minus 1 from 0 to 3. Okay, from 0 to 3. x equals 0, and so n equals 6. We're going to choose n equals 6, and we're going to use right end point. So if n equals 6 and, there's, and the, the length of the entire uh, interval is 3, then each subinterval is length 1 half. So I'm just going to split these up in, into 6 subintervals. And we're going to use the right end points of each subinterval. And so if we use the right end point, then what we get are these rectangles. See? Okay, so, so those are the approximating rectangles corresponding to choosing the right endpoint of each subinterval. Okay, and those are the areas of those six approximate rectangles. The area of, in the fourth subinterval, the area of the rectangle is zero because at the right end point of that subintral is x equals 2. And if you plug in x equals 2, you get f of 2 equals 2 squared minus 2 times 2, that's 0. So, so the height of that of the, the rectangle there is 0. So it's area 0. So that's why you don't see anything in this subintral. We're using a rectangle of area 0 to approximate um, the graph, the area um, in that subintral. OK, so so um, this time we're just going to approximate um, so we want the Riemann sum, okay? So the Riemann sum is the sum from i equals 1 to 6 of f of x sub i delta x, where x sub i is equal to 0, is where we started, plus i times delta x, and delta x is equal to 3 minus 0 over 6, which is 1 half. So this is equal to i times 1 half. So each x of i is, is uh, i times 1 half. OK? So what does x of i equal i times 1 half mean? That x that we took, and this is from i equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That means x of 1 is equal to 1 half. X of 1 times 1 half, x of 2 is 2 times 1 half, which is 1, x of 3 is 3 times 1 half, x of 4 is 4 times 1 half, x of 5 is 5 times 1 half, and x of 6 is 6 times 1 half. Okay, so you get those points. You get these right endpoints of each subinterval. Okay, so this sum is then equal to, we'll just plug in each one, this is f of 1 half times delta x plus f of 1 times delta x plus f of 3 halves times delta x plus f of 2 times delta x plus f of 5 halves times delta x plus f of 3 times delta x. Okay, so that's equal to, well factor out the delta x, delta x is 1 half, so this is 1 half times in parentheses f of 1 half plus f of 1 plus f of 3 halves plus f of 2 plus f of 5 halves plus f of 3. I'm just going to plug in, calculate and plug in the sum. f of 1 half is 1 half squared minus 2 times 1 half. That's 1 fourth minus 1. That's negative 3 fourths plus f of 1, which is negative 1. So you have minus 1 here. Plus f of 3 halves, 9 fourths um, minus 3. So 9 fourths minus 3 is 9 fourths minus 12 fourths. It's minus 3 fourths plus f of 2, that's 0, plus f of 5 halves, which is 5 halves squared. 25 over 4 minus 5. 25 minus 25 over 4 minus 20 over 4 is 5, is 5 fourths plus 5 fourths. Plus f of 3, which is 3 squared minus 2 times 3, 9 minus 6, which is 3. Okay, so I just calculate each of them, plug them in. 
And so this is equal to one half times that sum. So it's negative one and a half, negative two and a half, neg negative, negative one and a half, negative two and a half, a half, seven fourths. So you get seven fourths here. Okay, one half times seven fourths, which is seven eighths. And so the Riemann sum, where n equals six and you use right end points, is equal to seven eighths. That's an approximation for the area under the curve where what's here is negative area, what's there is positive area. And as you can see, the first three areas are negative, and the last three are either zero or positive. Zero, and then the other two are positive. All right, so that's number two. That's number two. Next one. Case number 14. Okay, so for number 14, it's use the midpoint rule with the given value of n to approximate the integral. Round to four. Okay, so it's the word. So we use the midpoint rule to approximate this. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to approximate that. Um, we're going to use the midpoint rule. Okay, and we're going to use the midpoint rule. So if we use the midpoint rule, first let's look at the, the interval from 1 to 4. Okay, it's length 3. And we're going to divide the length 3 interval by 6. We have 1 half. So each, we're adding one half for each time. So this is going to be 1.52, 2.53, 3.5, 2.5, 1 and 4. Okay, so that's where our sum rules are. We use the midpoint rule. And so as our points, we're going to choose as our points. I don't want to put it up. Okay, uh, our midpoints are here, 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 and here. They're the midpoints of each sub interval. So this one and a quarter, which is five fourths. This is one and three fourths, which is seven fourths. This is nine fourths. This is 11 fourths, 13 fourths, 15 fourths. I'm just adding two fourths each time. Okay, so this midpoint of the first sub is five fourths. The next midpoint is seven fourths, nine fourths, 11 fourths, 13 fourths, 15 fourths. Okay, so we can, the, the, the value of the step integral is approximately, I want to call f of x, the square root of x cubed plus one. So this is approximately f of five fourths times length of the sub integral, which is one half, plus f of seven fourths times one half, plus f of nine fourths times one half, plus f of eleven fourths times one half, plus f of thirteen fourths times one half plus f of 15 fourths times one half. And we get six products, one for each sub interval, and then this is equal to f of five fourths. Um, and so you just plug it in. So you plug in five fourths cubed plus one, take the square root, and multiply by one half, and you do all these calculations in your calculator and you get the answer. Okay? All right, so I don't waste time doing that. Okay, so that's number 14. Okay, using the midpoint rule. Okay. Next is number 20. Okay, so for number 20, use the form of the definition of the integral given in theorem form to evaluate the integral. Okay, so here we have the definition interval from one to four. Uh, x squared minus 4x plus 2 dx. And so theorem 4 Okay, so theorem 4 
is the one that says the definite integral, which is theorem four. Theorem four tells you that if f is integrable on the finite closed integral a comma b, then the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity, the sum from i equals one to n of f of x of i delta x, where delta x is equal to b minus a over n, and x of i is equal to a plus i delta x. Okay, that's theorem four. So I use the, that theorem to calculate this definite integral. So this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of f of x of i delta x, where x delta x is that, x of i is that. This is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of f of x of i. This is f of x, okay? So f of x of i is x of i squared minus four x of i plus two and delta x is b minus a over n. So here delta x is b minus a over n. That's four minus one over n. That's three over n. This is times three over n. Oh, okay, and then x of i, x of i is a plus i delta x. a is 1, that's 1 plus i times delta x, which is 3 over a. So x of i is 1 plus i times 3 over a. I'm just going to plug in x of i for 1 plus i times 3 over a. This is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of x of i squared, which is one plus i times three over n squared minus four times one plus i times three over n plus two times three over n. Okay, so I just substitute x of i for one plus i times three over n. I got one plus i times three over n squared minus four times one plus i times three over n plus two times three over n. Okay, so now I'm going to say this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n. Uh, I want to square that. And so when you square that, you get one plus um, i times 2 times 3 over n, which is 6 over n, plus this squared, which is i squared times 9 over n squared. So I just squared that. That squared is this. So this squared is that. This braces for that. So that's this. Minus 4 times that, which is minus 4 minus 4 times that, which is minus i times 12 over n. 4 times 3 is 12. Okay, 12 there. And then plus 2. Oh wait, yeah. Plus 2 is after the minus 4 times that. And then plus 2. And I'm going to take that whole thing and multiply it by 3 over n. That's the sum of that whole thing. limit of the sum of that whole thing. And so that's equal to the limit. Equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of, and now we combine like terms. So you get 1 minus 4 plus 2. That's minus 1. So 1 minus 4 is minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1. 
um, the i's, you have i times 6 over n minus i times 12 over n. That's minus i times 6 over n. And then this is plus, there's only one i squared term, so this is plus i squared times 9 over n squared. So 9. Okay, so that whole sum, well, what's in the bracket? I'll keep the things the same. That's what's in the bracket. And then times 3 over n. So it's the limit of the sum of that, which is equal to the limit of the sum of this times 3 over n. Once you get negative 3 over n. Um, minus i times 18 over n squared plus i squared times 9 times 3 is 27 over n squared times n, which is n cubed. And you get that. So now you have the limit of the sum of that. All right? Okay, so we used this theorem already, and we calculated this, so I'm going to erase this so it have more room. And so now I'm going to say that this is equal to, I'm going to put a star here. For my star, I just need to continue over here. Okay, so this equals, I'm continuing over here. This is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of. And now I'm going to take each sum uh, separately. So this is going to be the sum of. So I'm going to take the sum, but I'm going to move. Um, I'm going to move out the constants in each sum. So it's going to be a limit, and the first sum is negative 3 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1. minus 18 over n squared times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i plus 27 over n cubed times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. Okay? okay? So then this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 3 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1. That's just adding 1 to n times to get n. This is minus 18 over n squared. The sum from i equals 1 to i is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus n. That's n times n plus 1 over 2. And this is plus 27 over n cubed times this sum, which is the sum of the squares from 1 to n. And that's n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Okay, this is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6 for the formulas I wrote before. Okay, and so now you just need to calculate this limit. Okay, so I already wrote, uh, so I'm going to have to erase this, okay? So there is this in between step, and then I say this is equal to this. Okay, so, then, so now this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 3 over n times n is negative 3 and you get minus 18 times n over n times oh this is over 2 sorry n times n plus 1 over 2 this is so 18 over 2 is 9 is n over n times n plus 1 over n there's two different this is n squared which is n times n so you take one factor of n squared, which is n, and divide n by it, 
So you get n over n. Take the other factor of n here, and n, n plus 1 over n there. n times n, n times n plus 1. Okay, and this is plus 27 over 6 times n over n times n plus 1 over n times 2n plus 1 over n. Okay, so, so this is a n over n, n plus 1 over n, and 2n plus 1 over n. This is 2n plus 1 over n. This is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 3 minus 9. What, n over n is 1, and n plus 1 over n is 1 plus 1 over n. And this is plus, divide by 3, 9 over 2. 9 over 2 times 1 plus 1 over n times 2 plus 1 over n. Okay, and you just calculate that limit. And so I'm going to put this here to separate that part from this part. And so that is equal to, now calculating the limit. Now I'm going to calculate the limit, so I'm going to get rid of the limit symbol. This is negative 3 minus 9. This is, the limit of this is 1. One plus, the limit of 1 plus 1 over n goes to 1. That goes to 1. And that also goes to 1. That goes to 2. So this is negative 3 minus 9 plus 9 halves times 1 times 2, which is 2. So this is equal to negative 12 plus 9, which equals negative 3. That's the answer. Okay, so this definite integral is equal to negative 3. So that's number 20. This is using def this is using limit definition. Using limit definition, um, you know, for in the textbook to calculate the definite integral. It's a very long problem. Okay, so you need to know how to do this. Okay, next problem. 35. Okay, so the last one for this section, 4.2, is over 35. It's so number 35 is uh, evaluate the integral by interpreting it in terms of areas. And so. The definite integral from negative 1 to 2 of the absolute value of x dx. Okay, so we want to find that area. And so if you look at the graph here, we'll look at the absolute value of x. Okay, so this is y equals the absolute value of x. And so if you look at negative 1, the height of the function is 1. And 2, the height of the function is Two. Okay, and so the definite so we're going to get this area by interpreting it in terms of areas. And so this definite rule is equal to the area of this triangle plus the area of that triangle. Right? That's the area under the, this function from negative one to two. This has base one and this has height one. So the area of that triangle is one half times one times one. That's one half plus this base is two. This height is 2. 1 half times base times height is 2. So that's area 2. So 2 plus 1 half is 5 halves. And so that definite rule is equal to 5 halves, interpreting it in terms of areas. Okay, so that's number 35. Okay, okay. next. So next is 4.3, uh, numbers 2, 8, 18, 34, and 37. So for number 2, so for 4.3, number 2, it's evaluate the integral. So the integral from 1 to 2 of 4x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x dx. 
Okay, so we're just going to use the uh, evaluation theorem. Okay, so, um, so the evaluation theorem says find an antiderivative of this function and evaluate from the lower limit to the upper limit. So an antiderivative is x to the fourth minus x cubed plus x squared. And we're evaluated from 1 to 2. Okay, this is by the evaluation theorem. The evaluation theorem. Okay, it's part of the fundamental theorem calculus. Okay, derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x. So this is an antiderivative. So you plug in 2, you get 2 to the fourth minus 2 cubed plus 2 squared minus plug in 1, 1 to the fourth minus 1 cubed plus 1 squared. Okay, and so then that's equal to. 16 minus 8, which is 8, 8 plus 4, which is 12. 12 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 is 1. 12 minus 1 is 11. So that depth integral is equal to 11. Simplify it, let's think of everything in terms of sine and cosine. So we can think of tan squared theta and secant squared theta in terms of sine and cosine. Um, and so tan squared theta, let's look at tan squared theta divided by secant squared theta. Because that's what's happening here. And then it would be this divided by this also, right? This is the same as def integral from 0 to pi over 3 of sine theta over secant squared theta plus sine theta tan squared theta over secant squared theta. And we'll just write as two separate sums there. And now I'm going to look specifically at tan squared theta over secant squared theta and we'll see what we get. This is going to be sine squared theta over cosine squared theta over 1 over cosine squared theta. Um, secant squared theta is 1 over cosine squared theta. Tan squared theta is sine squared theta over cosine squared theta. And so the cosine squared theta is can't, the 1 over cosine squared theta is cancel, and we're left with this is equal to sine squared theta. And so t, tan squared theta over secant squared theta is equal to sine squared theta. And so this over this is equal to sine squared theta. Okay? Now sine theta over secant squared theta, sine theta over secant squared theta is equal to sine theta divided by 1 over cosine squared theta. Okay? Secant squared theta is 1 over cosine squared theta. This is equal to sine theta times cosine squared theta. Okay, so sine theta over secant squared theta is sine theta cosine squared theta. So I'm going to make that substitution. This is step integral from 0 to pi over 3 of sine theta over secant squared theta over secant squared theta, which is sine theta cosine squared theta plus sine theta times tan squared theta over secant squared theta, which is sine squared theta d theta. So now we end up with this. Okay. Um, And so now I'm going to do something weird. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to separate this into two separate def integrals first, which is not that weird. The def integral is 0 to pi over 3 of sine theta cosine squared theta d theta plus the def integral from 0 to pi over 3 of sine theta. I'm going to keep it separate. I'm going to keep it sine theta times sine squared theta. 
I'm not going to multiply them. You'll see why. So to calculate this first step in integral, I'm going to use u substitution. Right? And to, to be able to do these things or see them, you just need practice. And sometimes if you can't see it, uh, just seeing me do it and then mimicking it will help you do it. Okay? So you just need this to do and see problems to be solved. Right? And the tricks, you just need to see the tricks happen. So you're going to see this trick happen. I'm going to let u be sine theta. Okay? So if I let u equal sine theta. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I'm going to let u be cosine theta. I'm going to let u equal cosine theta. And then du is going to be negative sine theta, d theta. Okay, why did I do that? Well, this is equal to negative the integral of cosine squared theta times negative sine theta, d theta. I just put two negatives, one inside, one outside. And then the negative sine theta, d theta is du. And then cosine squared theta is u squared. And this is plus this integral. And so I'll get I'll write that down. This is from 0 to pi over 3. This is negative the integral of u squared times du. And when x, when theta is 0, cosine of 0 is 1. And when theta is pi over 3, um, you get u is 1 half. And so that's equal to the def integral from negative the def integral from 1 to 1 half of u squared to u. Now this is plus, now instead of sine squared theta, I'm going to write 1 minus cosine squared theta. So this is from 0 to pi over 3 of sine theta times 1 minus cosine squared theta, uh, d theta. And so now u, I'm going to let u be the exact same thing. u is cosine theta du is negative sine theta d theta. So here's a sine theta d theta. I'm going to put a negative here and I'm going to put a negative outside. So I have my negative sine theta here. Negative negative is plus, same value. Negative sine theta d theta is du. That's du. And 1 minus cosine squared theta is 1 minus u squared. And so this is minus the def integral, 1 minus u squared, 1 minus u squared, um, and negative sine theta d theta is du. And actually, it's the same limits, so it's going to be from 1 to 1 half. But now that I see, now that I've separated them, I kind of regret doing that. So I'm going to combine these, because they have, they have the same um, limits of integration. So I'm going to make this into one integral again. And this is now going to be the negative of the integral from 1 to one half of u squared plus one minus u squared du. And then the u squared and the minus u squared will cancel, and this is the integral of one. So this is going to be equal to star. I'm just going to move over here because I have more room here. And so that def integral is equal to negative the def integral from one to one half of one du. That's equal to switching the limits of integration and negating the integral from 1 half to 1 of 1 du. That's equal to um, an integer which is u evaluated from 1 half to 1. That's 1 minus 1 half. That's equal to 1 half. So the final answer is that def integral equals 1 half. That's number, uh, that's number, sorry, that's 18. I wrote 8 here. It's 18. Okay, so that's 18. Okay, so that's number 18. And now let's go to number 37. Evaluate the integral and interpret as a difference of areas, areas illustrated with the sketch. And so this is a blue highlighted problem. So that means it's difficult. Or 
Okay. So the value of the integral in antiderivative x to the fourth over four of that over four value from negative one to two. And so this is um, two to the fourth over four minus negative one to the fourth over four. That's equal to 16 over four, which is four minus one fourth. And so that's equal to 15 fourths. Okay. Uh, so that depth integral equals 15 fourths using the evaluation theorem here. So here we use the evaluation theorem. Or you can also say the fundamental theorem of calculus, because evaluation theorem is part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay? Okay. Uh, interpret it as a difference of areas illustrated through the sketch. This is a second way to compute it x axis, y axis. And so you have y equals x cubed here. And so you have negative 1, and you have 2. And so the area under here. That's part of it, and then from two, it's here. Okay. And so the depth integral is equal to the positive area of this minus the negative area of that. I mean, this area minus that area. Okay. So if this is a one and this is a two, then the depth integral from negative one to two of x cubed dx is equal to a one that area minus that area of two. Right, in the picture. Okay, and we calculated we found it's 15 fourths. So that's number 37 in 4.3. Okay, let's keep going to 4.4. Okay, so for 4.4, we have 6, 10, 16, and 19. So for number six, it says, use part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the derivative of the function. Okay, so part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus says, if g of x is equal to the definition from, from a to x of f of t dt, then g prime of x is equal to f of x. Okay, that implies that. That's part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so we're going to use that to find the answer to six. And so here, g of x is equal to the depth integral from one to x of two plus t to the fourth raised to the fifth power dt. Okay, f of t here is this. That's f of t. And so by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, uh, that implies that g prime of x is equal to um, f of x. Here a is 1 and x is there. And so here it's just f of x. So what's f of x? You just plug in x there. Okay, that's g prime of x. That's number 6. Um, Okay, so number 10, the same question. Use the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the derivative of the function. So for number 10, h of x is equal to the definition from 0 to x squared of the square root of 1 plus r cubed dr. Okay, so by the fundamental theorem, by the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, that implies that h prime of x is equal to, you plug in, instead of plugging in x, um, you could also say that the fundamental theorem of calculus tells you, the first part tells you this, if you have a function from a to a function um, h of x, uh, f of t dt, that implies that g prime of x is equal to f of h of x times h prime of x. Okay, that's uh, by the chain rule. Okay, so it's, if this is instead of being x, if this is instead of function of x, call it h of x, then this depth integral is equal to plugging in that function into f and then multiplying by the derivative. So here, h of x is x squared. And so f of h of x is, is this, this is f. That's f of x, this is h of x, okay? 
but now I mean f of let's call it y. Okay, um, and so now um, f of h of x is now uh, the square root of one plus x squared cubed. Square root of one plus x squared cubed is f of h of x times h prime of x is times the derivative of that, which is 2x, and that's the answer. So h prime of x is equal to the square root of 1 plus x squared cubed times 2x. So it's this square root times 2x. That's h prime of x. All right, so that's number 10. Um, number 16. Okay, so number 16. Okay, so for number 16, find the average value of the function on the given interval. Okay, so f of x is equal to x minus x squared, and the interval is 0, 2. So you want to find the average value of that function on the given interval. And so the f of the average value on an interval, is equal to 1 over 2 minus 0, times the definition from 0 to 2, of x minus x squared dx, by the definition of the average value. Okay, so that's equal to 1 half times the definition from 0 to 2 of x minus x squared dx. So we evaluate that. It's 1 half times the value of its f integral. And the antiderivative is x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3. We evaluate it from the lower limit to the upper limit from 0 to 2. Okay, so this is equal to 1 half times um, plugging in 2. You have 2 squared over 2 minus 2 cubed over 3. Uh, minus 0 squared over 2 minus 0 cubed over 3. And so that's equal to 1 half times 2 minus 8 thirds. Minus 0. And so what's that? That's 1 half times negative 2 thirds. That's equal to negative 1 third. The average value of that function is um, is negative one third on that on that interval from zero to two. You get six thirds minus eight thirds, negative two thirds. One half times negative two thirds is negative one third. Okay, so that's the average value on that sub interval. Okay, let's go to the next section, which is four point five. Okay, so for 4.5, we have the numbers 3, 8, and 14. Okay. Okay, so for number 3, which is a highlighted problem, um, you find the integral of x squared times the square root of x cubed plus 1 dx. Where u is x cubed plus 1. Okay, so they're telling you the u substitution to make. Okay, so du is equal to 3x squared dx. So this is equal to what we're missing here is the 3, because we have x squared dx, we're missing a 3. So I'm going to plug in that 3. I'm going I'm to rearrange the terms and plug in that 3. So it's the square root of x cubed plus 1 times 3x squared dx. I added a 3, so I added 1 third there and they cancel. So equal to 1 third the integral of the square root of u, because that is u, okay? That's u. And then times 3x squared dx, and that's du. So that's du, okay? And so in exponential form, that's 1 third the integral of 1u to 1 half du. Square root of u is u one half, and so that's equal to one third times the antiderivative u one half, which is u to the three halves over three halves, or two thirds times that, and then plus a constant c. This is equal to two ninths times u, which is x cubed plus one, uh, raised to the three halves, plus c. 
that's it. Okay, so that is the most general antiderivative of x squared times the square root of x cubed plus 1, 2 ninths times x cubed plus 1 to 3 halves plus c. That's number 3. Okay, uh, next one is number 8. Okay. This next one is number 8. Um, it's the integral of, of x squared cosine of x cubed dx. So we're going to let u be x cubed, and du is 3x squared dx. So I have an x squared dx, I'm missing a 3. So I'm going to put that 3 there. I'm first going to rearrange the term. So it's cosine of x cubed times 3x squared dx. I added the 3 here, so I'm adding a 1 third on the outside, so it cancels. This is equal to 1 third, the integral of cosine of x cubed, which is u, times 3x squared dx, which is du. 3x squared dx is du, and the x cubed is u. Okay, and this is equal to 1 third, and the antiderivative of cosine u is sine u, and then plus c. So 1 third sine u plus c is 1 third sine of u is x cubed, so sine of x cubed plus c. It's the most general antiderivative of x squared cosine x cubed is 1 third sine of x cubed plus c. That's the answer to number 8. 4.5. Um, Okay, one more. This is number 14. Okay, so number 14 from 4.5. So number 14 is find the integral of x over x squared plus 1 squared dx. 14. And so this is equal to, I want to let u equal x squared plus 1. The u is equal to 2x dx. So the u is going to go here and you get u squared here. x dx is here, but we're missing a 2. And so I'm going to add the 2. Uh, I'm going to add the 2 there. But then I'm going to add a 1 half in front to cancel out the 2 that I added. So this is equal to 1 half the integral of 2x dx is the u over u squared. 2x squared plus 1 is u. And so an anti this is the same as one half the integral of u to the negative two du exponential form. I like to think it that way. One half times an antiderivative of u to the negative two is u to the negative one over negative one plus c. This is equal to negative one half u to negative one plus c. And that's equal to negative one half u, which is x squared plus one, to negative one plus c. That's the final answer. 14, we get um, negative 1 half times x squared plus 1 to negative 1 plus c. And that's number 14 for that. All right, and so that's the review sheet. That's most of the problems um, in 4.3. Uh, and in number, in 4.3, we can go over number 18. Number, not number 18, number 8. I want to make sure I cover everything. Okay, and so in 4.3, number 8. Okay, so for number 8, evaluate the integral. And so for number 8, we evaluate the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over x squared minus 4 over x cubed dx. And so in, in, um, exponent, in using, an ex, using exponents, it's x to the negative 2 minus 4 x to the negative 3 dx. That's equal to an antiderivative is x to the negative 1 over negative 1 minus 4 times x to the negative uh, 2 over negative 2 uh, evaluated from 1 to 2. That's equal to negative x to the negative 1. Minus 1 over minus 2 is plus 2 x to the negative 2. That evaluated from 1 to 2. This is equal to, you plug in 2, you get negative 2 to the negative 1 plus 2 times 
2 to negative 2 minus negative 1 to negative 1 plus 2 times 1 to negative 2. Okay? And so that's equal to negative 1 half plus, this is negative 1 half plus 2 over 4 minus negative 1 plus 2. So that's equal to negative one half plus one half, which is zero, minus negative one plus two, which is one. So you get negative one. The final answer is negative one. Okay, so that's number two. Okay, so I'll stop there. And so I hope this review should help you prepare for the first exam.